You know, a 10 year old who have been in shape from three till nine, those horses are going to condition probably a lot faster than a horse that's, you know, kind of done this his whole life, um, been in somewhat sort of shape and then out of shape for six months and then in shape, those horses won't condition as fast because they don't have the muscle memory to, um, build up that muscle again. Totally. Anything you want to add to that? Uh, actually I was, we were talking right before the presentation, a nice rule of thumb from, um, sort of a guru in the, in the industry for conditioning sport horses, Hillary Clayton. She says like, when you're conditioning a horse, a reasonable rule of thumb is to expect for every one month of, of training or exercise that horse has had off, it'll take much, uh, a month of conditioning for every one month off. So if your horse has been turned out for four months, you should realistically give them four months, you know, to get to a reasonable level of fitness. So this one for me is really important. Um, conditioning is never finished. It's not like a place that you end up or you're not like one day, Oh my gosh, my horse is as fit as they're going to be. And that's all we're going to, that's as far as I'm going to go. Um, I think it's something that you're always building on to get your horse stronger and better so that they can be more competitive. Um, and there's so many different ways that you can do this. I mean, a lot of people think of conditioning, I feel like as trotting around a track or, um, you know, just going to the arena and making runs, but conditioning can be so much broader than that. And there's so many different ways that you can help your horse be strong, um, mentally and physically. And so I think it's really important to just remember that, you know, one day you're not just done conditioning. It's something that you're always working towards and should be kind of something that you think about in a yearly plan. Yes. You're going to give your horse some time off, but what does that time off look like for them and you know when do I want them to peak and be their fittest for the year um and go on like that yeah totally I remember like when I uh was bringing horses into work like as a teenager with barrel horses I would long trot them and lope circles and that was it <laughs> for two weeks <laughs> for two weeks go, and a lot of people are still yeah. doing that <laughs> so yeah there's a little more to it that we'll get into than just long trotting and loping circles yeah and I feel like it's really evolved over the past 15 years yeah. to, mm -hmm. I mean, we know so much more and we know, um, things that maybe seem silly or not productive 15 years ago are now very important, um, yeah. <laughs> for performance horses too. And so, you know, you have to ask yourself, um, it's really fun to just go catch your horse and go use them, um, kick them out, not ride them for two weeks and then take them, you know, to the barrel race or the jackpot again. But why conditioning is important. Um, and I mean, Becky can talk more on this too, but reduce chance of injury, improve their performance and increase their longevity over time so that your horse will actually last you longer. Yeah, absolutely. And, and considering too, like reducing the chance of injury, we also have to think about, um, and this is where, you know, my side of things kind of come in. Is there an old injury that we're dealing with too? Because obviously injuries heal with different collagen types. If there's scar tissue, that's going to take a lot longer to continue to condition that tissue than a normal healthy tissue. So putting that into account as well and working with your team um, to make sure that you're giving that horse enough time that it's going to have a lower chance of re-injury. So, yes. And nowadays we spend enough money on our horses as it is. So you can reduce your vet bills. Um, and also, you know, when you're going, you have to pay to play usually. And if you have a chance of, you know, winning some money back or something like that, then, you know, conditioning can be important in that factor too. And I'm not going to lie. Everyone's a little competitive. I like to win. So, <laughs> um, I find that, you know, if you have a fit horse, you have a lot better chance of doing so. Um, so again, like I said, people, I feel like conditioning is just going out and trotting stuff like that. Um, we're going to come through with a lot of examples later on in the PowerPoint, um, for different methods of conditioning. But conditioning is basically constant repetition and increase of work over time um, to improve their fitness. And you want to be stressing the body. Like work is stress and that's how the body builds and grows. So, I mean, just going out and going for a leisurely walk, you know, for 10, 15 minutes, 
if you do that three times a week, you can't do that for a month and be like, oh, my horse is in yeah. shape now, right? Um, so it is something that does take some time. And I mean, like I said, I always compare everything back to humans, but whether you go to the gym or you play sports, things like that, you need to be stressing your body every time. And you need to think about that, um, in horse terms. Absolutely. There's a lot of, you can always look up the fancy term is like progressive loading. So some stress is good. Too much stress is bad, but we always want, yeah, like to find that happy spot where we're still creating new stresses and new stimuli so that we continue progressing in the conditioning and the fitness of our tissues and our cardiovascular fitness as well. So, um, obviously, you know, it's going to not move like this. It's going to move, you know, plateau, and then we're going to increase the stimuli again as we move forward. It's the same when, you know, you start exercising too. Yeah. And, um, conditioning work is generally not sport specific. So it usually doesn't matter what discipline you're in. Um, your initial conditioning program, the first couple of months can actually look very similar for all types of horses and all different breeds, you know, starting with like lots of walk, trot, walk, trot, lope, things like that. Um, some of the stretching, the interval training, stuff like that can all be very, I feel like it's very inclusive of all Mm -hmm. disciplines and, and horses. And then you can work up to your sport specific or discipline specific, um, conditioning after you have kind of reached a certain point. Um, and I guess the question is too, when do you reach that point? Like, when do you feel your horse is ready to start discipline specific work? Um, do you have an answer for that vet? <laughs> yeah. And I guess it's kind of taking into consideration. Yeah. What's that horse's job. So, um, when we think about conditioning, we're not only conditioning physically, but we're conditioning mentally. So if we're, um, if you take a racehorse, their job is very different than say a cowboy challenge horse where, you know, the racehorse, we're going to really demand a lot of cardiovascular fitness and muscular fitness and tendon fitness and ligament fitness where cowboy challenge horse, we're going to ask a lot of, you know, mental fitness where, um, you know, they're responding properly, appropriately to different stimuli, different, you know, new environments and stuff. So, um, it's a little bit dependent on what the job of the horse is. Um, similarly, like an endurance horse has different demands on his body than a jumping horse where it's a lot of explosive movements versus the endurance where it's a lot of long repetitive movements. Right. So it's going to vary a little bit, but yeah, you know, one indicator that we use, um, in a more of a research setting and similar to humans is, is heart rate and recovery time. Right. So, and mm-hmm. that's a little more how you probably run your conditioning programs at Cooley and sort of telling how, how things are progressing. Right. Yeah. And I was like said, constantly, loading them a little bit every day, stressing them out, um, in a good way. Stress is what the body needs to remodel and build more muscle. Um, yeah, this part is super interesting to me as well as it is to Becky, (laughs) but, um, what are you actually trying to condition when you are working your horse? So, um, tissue responds differently to stress and some tissue takes longer to condition than others. So you think, um, you know, you want to condition their cardiovascular, so their heart, their arterial system, um, they'll actually make new pathways through their muscles, right. To get Mm -hmm. more blood flow to them and stuff. So that is part that you can condition as well as the respiratory system. So they'll actually, you know, expand their lungs and be able to use more capacity of their lungs when they're conditioned muscles, muscles get stronger, more pliable, Um, you know, we want them to be nice and free so they can move and then tendon ligament. And the coolest one for me, I think is bone because, um, until I had kind of gone through all this stuff a few years ago, you don't really think of conditioning bone in your horse, but it actually can take up to six months to strengthen Mm -hmm. bone. Tendon ligament is four to six months, but then your other three, your cardiovascular, your respiratory, your muscle, um, it's kind of tricky because they can condition a lot quicker, you know, in a couple of weeks, you can see a lot of change in the horse's body as far as that stuff goes, but you do see most of your injuries <laughs> in tendon ligament, um, and then bone, right? Yeah. And you can get a little, we see people get a little tricked, right? Because fair enough, your cardiovascular, your respiratory and your muscle are the fastest three to get what we call conditioned, right? Your tendon and ligament and your bone are the slowest. So you can 
take your horse out and it's like, okay, he can long trot or, or, you know, lope or canter for 60 minutes and recover really well. And, you know, isn't breaking a sweat, but doesn't necessarily mean those tendon and ligaments are ready for, you know, competitive work. So, um, and those ones are a little harder to measure. And that's where sometimes if you, um, aren't sure, like it's worth getting a vet check and, and we can, you know, palpate those, um, you know, when you're palpating tendons every single day, um, all day, like we can actually feel a difference <laughs> in horses that have been off versus horses that are working a lot. Like they just get a different pliability to them. Um, you know, your massage therapists, they're quite good at that as well. Maybe a little more specific for muscle bone is probably the hardest to measure realistically. Like there's some research settings where we can use different, um, metrics to look at those, but yeah, it's, it's always a little of a guessing game, but you know, just sort of erring on the side of caution or insurance, giving yourself enough time, um, mm-hmm. so that you can be confident that you've given them the the four months or the five months to get those tissues as strong as they can so that you lower your risk of injury. Yeah. And so based on my reading, and again, Becky can weigh in on this, um, the best ways to strengthen your tendon ligament and bone are concussion over harder surfaces. Um, so I mean, like going out maybe in the pasture, I mean, don't mean trotting down the pavement road for harder (laughs) surfaces, but more of like a hard grass or harder dirt surface, you know, more of a track, like not working in deep sand is actually the concussion is what causes that bone to be more dense or the tendon ligaments to be more pliable. Yeah. And, and, you know, or even just different surfaces too, right? So softer surfaces are going to put more stretch on, especially those tendons and ligaments often, um, where, yeah, more concussive forces are, are going to provide different stresses. So exposing your horse to variables is going to get those as strong as possible. So, um, but always, yeah, being cognizant of not injuring your horse in the process. That's obviously not what we want, but, uh, but yeah, absolutely. So cross training is one of my favorite things to incorporate into conditioning programs. Um, I think it's something that is really important that you do with your horse kind of all year. Um, not necessarily just when you're conditioning or trying to get ready for competition. So cross training is athletic training in sports other than the athlete's usual sport. So, um, you know, I have an example in here of like a barrel racer going, doing cow horse work or, um, you know, a jumper, maybe doing dressage or something like, you know, just changing up their daily routine. I think it's great for them mentally, um, as well as really good for them. It's like a, an athlete, like a hockey player going and doing yoga. Um, they may not like it in the beginning, but they will (laughs) actually start to see the benefits of it long-term in the longevity of their careers and stuff like that, because all of a sudden they can, you know, do things that maybe don't hurt them as much or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think cross training is something that's really important to incorporate. So I have a lot of things here and we'll kind of go through them and talk about them. Um, but like I said, other disciplines, I think it's very beneficial for you and your horse to go take lessons from somebody maybe outside of your discipline or somebody above your level. Um, and just see, you know, how they handle things or, things that they would incorporate into your training to help your horse get stronger. Um, find in the English world, everyone kind of has a trainer, whereas more in the Western world, especially the rodeo world, <laughs> a little more solo. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're kind of <laughs> on your own. Whereas, um, you know, I know there's clinics and stuff, but if you can go take lessons from, you know, someone who has a lot of experience in the mm-hmm. industry and, you know, I think it's really beneficial for your horse, but also really beneficial for you. Um, Interval training. So this one's, I think this one's fun because it, I like doing interval training because it seems like it's shorter than mm-hmm. doing like long bursts of cardio. Yeah. I'm not much for runner. <laughs> yeah. Um, so interval training is like short bursts of high intensity exercise with longer periods of rest. So this is where you can be like 30 seconds of, you know, 75% effort. Yeah. Um, with like a minute and a half of rest and then go back and do that again. Um, also noticing your horse's like recovery time in, in those minute and a half periods and, you know, hoping that they're improving on that over time. This is great. Like when you can get outside when it's nice and you can go out in the field and do this, you know, you set a little timer on your 
watch run your wrist. And I think it's really good for the horse. It's also really good for them to like go fast, slow down, go fast, mm-hmm. slow down. Um, and they're going to train different things, right? So interval training, you're going to be using muscle fibers that are what we call fast twitch uh, muscle fibers. And it's going to really work your cardiovascular, your respiratory for long trotting. It will, but in a different way, the heart rate doesn't spike and then come back down. Um, and you're going to be using those slower twitch muscle fibers. So if you can incorporate, you know, several of these things, you're going to train different neurogenic pathways in the body and use different muscle fibers. And, and overall, that's going to make your horse more complete and fit versus just working, you know, one certain type of the body. So, mm-hmm. um, so yeah, long trotting, as like you said, that's different from interval training. Long trotting is also good too. If you need to like get out and clear your head or something, I like, you know, just going out and trotting out in the field. And that's really good too, for, um, changing surfaces. Uh, you know, if you've been doing lots of work in the arena or doing your interval training inside, you know, to be able to get out and do some long trotting, you can also do it in indoors. Yeah. Um, it is mentally nice for yeah, the horse, especially is, if they're in a, in an arena setting all the time, it's, it's good for them to look, yeah. get outside, look around. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, hill work. I'm not sure if you've ever been, if you've ever been to Cooley, you know why it's called Cooley, <laughs> some big hills, but you know, going out, um, doing that. So zigzagging down, walking straight up, forcing them to walk straight up, not letting them lunge, um, to get up the hill is really good for them. You know, even like the zigzagging down, it's really good for their core and using different muscle, like stabilizer muscles, I guess, not muscles that they use necessarily in work, but good muscles to have for when they are going competing. There's actually an interesting, um, research that they did looking at horses going downhill for exercises. And they use a lot of the same muscles as horses that are in a discipline that uses heavy collection. So say dressage or, um, maybe even like show jumping where you're really collecting that horse up. It uses a lot of the same, um, muscles and they really have to, yeah, use those stabilizers as well. So downhill work is, is actually good for, for those types of disciplines, obviously not overdoing it. It is quite hard on joints to be going downhill, just like when we go hiking and our knees hurt after. So in moderation, Mm -hmm. but it is, it was an interesting um, paper that they looked at the engagement of these muscles and wasn't really one that I had, you know, thought was super obvious, but, um, but yeah, they use the the back and the neck and the hind quarter muscles. And it was all the same engagement as, as heavy collection work. So that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And then same with going uphill. Um, like I said, when you get them to walk, it's more like doing a wall sit. It's not giving them the easy way out <laughs> if they like want to plunge up or go faster. Um, it's because they know that the work is over sooner and it's a lot easier for them to do that. But like that slow climb mm-hmm. upwards is more of like I said, doing a, a wall sit or something where you have to sit and hold it. Um, and so that's, and you think of disciplines like barrel racing where you're pushing off out of a turn or cutting where you're pushing off out of turn or, or show jumping where you're pushing into the jump, like you're using those muscles mm-hmm. going up hills. So it's just a little, it's a similar stimulus, but it's not, it's a mentally different one as well, which is nice for the horse. Yeah. Um, working in bands. So I have a picture at the end, you know, you can be putting um, bands or under their bellies and around their bums. It helps increase their proprioception and makes them think about using those muscles of collection And I think, I mean, not everybody always rides in perfect collection, but I do think that that's something that's really important um, for horses to have strong cores and, you know, strong back and hip muscles. Uh, It's one of the harder things to condition if you're not focusing on it. I think, um, you know, I know a lot of people struggle with strengthening the top line and stuff like that. I see a lot of horses come to Cooley and they say, you know, I'd really like to work on this. the water treadmill is really good for that. I'll talk about that in a minute. It's really good for helping the strength in the top line, but also, you know, things you can do at home are the bands. And I do have some pictures later on or something like a Pessoa. If you want to lunge, if you have an arena where you can lunge and some of those things are really good too, because you don't always necessarily have to ride them. So if you don't have time to like tack up, you know, do a huge warm up and a huge cool down, um, like that, or if it's colder out, you know, you can do something shorter and quicker like that. That's really beneficial for them. Um, backing up is one of my personal favorites. I think it's a great skill for horses to have if they can do it, but it's also really good at helping straight, like strengthen the gluteal muscles up over their hips. Um, 
and then getting their backs stronger too. When they're stronger up top, it helps take a lot of tension off of their lower joints and stuff. So then it can actually save you a little bit in the long term, help with their longevity again. Um, you're not putting as much stress and pressure on their stifles and their hawks and stuff like that. So backing up is a good one. Like I said, it's a good tool to have and you can start depending on your horse. Some horses are much better at it than others, but start, you know, like even with 10 steps in a straight line and just see how your horse does it. Sometimes you might have to do it. If your horse doesn't back up a lot, you may have to start doing it, um, on halter, you know, in the arena to start them doing it. But it's also something that, if, you know, you work with the right trainer or something, you can cue them with your feet and they get pretty good at it. Um, it's something that takes them a long time to build up. It's, it's like people, you know, I don't mm -hmm. go to the gym twice and be like, Oh, my bum looks great. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, something that you have to do a lot of repetition with, but, um, I do think it's super beneficial mm -hmm. for the horses. Um, we talked about working on different surfaces. So it's not a bad thing to work in deeper ground or to work in on harder surfaces, um, especially if your horse is sound. I mean, obviously if you have some um, rehab stuff going on, your vet will give you those. Yeah. Sometimes if we have old injuries, um, we really are cognizant of the surfaces. Just it can put your horse at greater risk of re-injury depending on what the injury was. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have an old injury, um, yeah, chat with us about it before you start doing a lot of different surfaces. Cause sometimes we'll sort of just avoid certain ones if we, if we yeah. need to. So. Yeah. And of course with all of this too, it is to do with your sound, healthy, happy <laughs> yeah. horse. Um, obviously if you're having issues, you know, you probably need to see your vet and get some maintenance work done before, before starting to do a lot of this stuff. Um, trot pulls are another one. They're just like a good, again, mental break, even just getting them to walk over them and collect. Um, they're super easy to make. I have some pictures at the end again of those. Cause you know, I think sometimes too, we get stuck doing the same things. So it can be a good mental break and then doing lots of, um, core strengthening exercises. I mean, talk to your body worker, you know, horses have abs too. And yeah, it's, it's actually amazing how many horses we see that have really poor abdominal muscle tone. Um, that are otherwise really good. It's just, yeah, they haven't been, you know, forced to use them properly. So, yes. So, um, and that's another one of those things that, Hey, it's cold out today or the roads are bad. I can't haul to the arena, um, stuff like that, but it's just another good thing to add into mm -hmm. your program. I think, um, they don't take very long and your horse usually enjoys them because they usually get cookies at the end. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And for any of these, especially when you're starting out, um, just remember that just like when we go to the gym, especially if we start going pretty hard, you know, your muscles get sore and your horses get sore too. So, um, just be cognizant or, or consider like if your horse is doing really good and maybe they're more lazy today or they're more reluctant to do, they might be sore. So, you know, do all this within reason. Um, mm -hmm. you know, especially the core strengthening stuff. If your horse hasn't done them before, people will get a little overzealous and then their horse is like, Oh man, my abs hurt. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so yeah, like gradual introduction. Um, and then too, like, if there's any of these that your horse doesn't want to do, um, especially collection work, I find, um, it's like, okay, it's the horse not broke. Um, you know, or especially Western horses, they're not always asked to use themselves in collection. So sometimes it's just like a, yeah, like a training thing, but sometimes it's a pain thing. So we do see back pain with horses mm -hmm. and, and sometimes that manifests in, yeah, a lot of the collection work or, um, the backing up or the core strengthening stuff. So if you're like, it seems like you're fighting them, um, yeah, mm -hmm. maybe consider getting like a, a look at your horse and making sure that it's not a pain, um, thing. And maybe it's just like a, a fitness thing. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I agree with Becky on that. Get your vet first. Um, and then, you know, they might suggest a body worker or something from there. If it's just a little bit of muscle tightness, but you do want to eliminate anything because if you keep going on it, you're going to make the problem worse. <laughs> and and your horse will, will then you will a rehab program, <laughs> yeah. not a conditioning program. <laughs> exactly. So then, I mean, I'm, I'm from Cooley, so I'm going to do my shameless Cooley stuff here. Um, I mean, Becky comes to Cooley weekly, so she knows everything that we have. 
but I'm going to talk a little bit about the water treadmills. Um, that's kind of what I'm more well-versed in for sure. So, um, our water treadmill, and I tried to put a picture in there, you can see the horses go in they start walking on a dry belt and then we can raise the water. Um, we can usually get it up to their bellies or we can vary the water level height, uh, daily to work different muscle groups, or if it's more of a rehab program, then, you know, um, someone like Becky will say, okay, maybe this horse should work at this water height only while they're with you. And that's, um, totally fine too. We do a lot of that for the rehab. Like I said, a lot of the conditioning, we start to change the water depth so that they're using different muscles every day. Um, it's increased resistance. So if you're doing, um, working on your con conditioning program, it's increased resistance for them. And we do have the ability to change the water level heights. Um, the nice thing about working in the water is the water keeps the body a little bit cooler. So they don't get the same lactic acid buildup as they do when you're working them daily. So you won't get the same, um, muscle soreness after basically the same amount of work. Um, and we've done that. We've done our own studies with the university of Calgary on that. Um, so that was really interesting for us. It's also nice because it's all straight line work. So it doesn't allow for the same amount of compensation as if you're going and trotting and loping circles. Um, it's also great if a horse has been off for an extended period of time, they might be sore on one limb, um, might've been sore on one limb. And so then they tend not to use that limb as much. So they'll be weaker in that area. Um, so it kind of forces them to use that again and kind of catches that limb back up to the same strength as the rest of the body so that they aren't going to compensate as much when you go to get on them. Um, there's no rider imbalances or poor tack fit. Um, so, you know, something that's really important when you're conditioning as well is to make sure everything is fitting properly. If you have a saddle that is causing too much pressure, you know, is bridging, causing too much pressure in the front and too much pressure in the back, you know, or causing dry spots, things like that. Um, it's going to make your horse want to hollow out a little bit. They're going to want to push their belly out. They're not going to use their core properly. And that's how they're going to have to work, which in turn is going to affect their performance because they are not going to be engaging their core and pretty much any, um, any sport you play, you have to have a strong core, yeah. you know, like your highest athletes have strong cores. And I think it's very similar for horses. Um, yeah. You know, and the tack fit too, um, they have looked at this in research settings, the amount of changes that a horse's back can undergo, you know, as they go through a conditioning program and, and the ones they looked at were pretty extensive. They were like really fat horses that had no fitness and they put them through quite a long time of conditioning. But, um, but yeah, like saddles that fit when you start conditioning might not fit when you're done conditioning. And so, um, so just be aware of that. Like a lot of horses, once we get them conditioned might need a different fitting saddle, which you know, I know it's like, oh my gosh, how many saddles <laughs> do I need? But you might not just be aware that the back can change significantly as a horse gets yes. fit. So if now, you know, the saddle that fit a month ago, now it seems like if their back is sore, that might be the problem. So just be aware of that. Yeah. Best way to avoid that. Don't let them get so far out of shape that you exactly. have to get them this far back in shape. <laughs> that but you need several saddles. <laughs> but yeah. things happen or injuries happen and you're bringing them back. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that is, that's very true. You know, sometimes you can get away with a pad change, but other times you're going to need, need to look at a different saddle. Um, but same thing too, you know, you think people, if you've broken a bone or something, or you have had an injury to your back, you might ride imbalanced. So you're, pro you're projecting that onto your horse when you're riding. So the water treadmill is like kind of a great way to get them a good base of fitness and kind of get them a lot stronger everywhere else before they have to start compensating for you. And I mean, it's not anything that we're not going to ride because of, but if it, if you can get your horse that much farther ahead before you get on them, mm -hmm. um, I think it's really beneficial for the horse. It's also a great mental change. Um, I'd say like 99.9% .9 of horses end up loving working in the water. Um, you know, we have like a really good training process. We don't, we try not to stress them out. They can start like doors open. They don't feel enclosed. They don't, right. they don't feel like you're like pushing them into something and they have no choice. Um, and a lot of horses, if they feel that way, they have two reactions, which is to like fight or flight. And so, you know, we try to give them a really good 
training process with it so they can get really used to it. And then I find that they do really enjoy it. It's really cool too, because they don't forget. I've literally got horses back like five years later. <laughs> they just like, load up. <laughs> I know you. And they just hop right on and they work that day in water. So, um, they're very smart that way. And I think that's a good sign that they learn to really enjoy it too. Um, the ones that don't enjoy it are the ones that don't like to work that hard, but they definitely do like just going to coolies. It seems like they mentally treat it as a job. Um, when they're in there, they're like, yep, mm-hmm. going to work. And I go in my treadmill and yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's good too. And especially, you know, in the summer, um, we talk about cross training, um, people, we have clients that haul in weekly. So they add like water treadmill work into their weekly program, which I think is awesome. Um, you know, then they're able to work all week, do their sports specific training, do their other interval training, and then add this in as cross training. Um, but you know, we do a ton of, of work right now, springtime, gearing up for all of the events that are going to go this summer. <laughs> Fingers Maybe. crossed. Yeah. Um, just getting horses ready to go. And I think the biggest thing that, um, we can offer with it is the consistency. So, you know, when you bring your horse to a facility like Cooley or anywhere else that they are going to get that consistent work that's needed to build, to build the muscle and strengthen the cardiovascular system, um, and things like that. You know, we all have lives. It would be awesome if all we had to do was wake up and go ride our favorite horses. (laughs) And I mean, the people who ride horses for a living, it's a job for them too. So their horses get put on the back yeah, burner. Was the ones rode last. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> right. So, um, you know, I think that consistency is something that's just so important. You know, when you send them, you're going to build their condition that much faster because their workouts are going to be so consistent. Um, and I think that's really important so that when you get them back, you can maintain the condition that they're at. You may not be able to build a whole bunch on it if you're only able to ride three times a week, but you're at least going to be able to build on on the condition that they have. So that's like another huge benefit, um, about using water treadmill, even, you know, we kind of say, send them for a minimum of two weeks to start to see some good changes in the body. And then if you can stay on them from there, you can always build on it. Um, if you're looking to have them, you know, quite a bit more fit, or we talk about the factors in the beginning age, what kind of shape they're in, how long they've been off. These are all questions that I try to ask. Um, when horses get dropped off because it kind of changes their program might change how long they should stay with us at Cooley, you know, four to six weeks is super ideal, especially, you know, if you know, you're not going to be able to ride or build on it. Um, the four to six week mark is I think awesome because then you get a horse back that's had a lot of really consistent work. Mm -hmm. Um, and like, you know, increased resistance work, things like that. We can work them in the bands. Um, And yeah, you're just going to have a horse that's a lot happier when you get them back. The other thing with the water treadmill that I love is even when the water is filled to, you know, their belly, um, they never, we never have to force them into an unnatural working frame. So talking about, um, strengthening the core and stuff, you know, even in the lower water heights, they actually want to elevate. So they want to lift their belly and pick their legs up and out of the water, um, which is really good for strengthening their core and helping to strengthen their back and stuff like that. So sometimes your lower water levels are actually more important for the engagement side of it. Um, along with strengthening the rest of the muscles in your body, but it's something that people maybe don't always think about. You don't ever want to work your horse in that unnatural. It's really hard to show on a zoom, head meeting, up, but that head up, back, out, out. Back, you know, pushing out their belly. Um, if you try to do that right now, everyone should turn their cameras on and try to do that. Yeah, <laughs> it's a, uh, it's really hard to do anything. It's not a natural working position for a human or for a horse, right? Like first thing they tell you in volleyball is like engage your core, spread your legs out and get ready for the ball. If you're standing there like this and the ball comes, you're going to get hit in the side of the face. That hurts my back. (laughs) Like thinking about that anyway. (laughs) Um, But I find that that's really true with horses too. We don't think about strengthening a horse's core, but with athletes, if an athlete, if a hockey player is walking across an icy parking lot, And he slips on the ice. He is probably going to catch himself. He might fall a little bit, but he's going to catch himself and he's going to probably be okay. But then you get, you know, my 80 year old grandma walking across that same parking lot who, you know, their musculature is quite atrophied, no core, (laughs) things like that. They're going to fall and they're going to hurt themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, so like 
we don't think about the core strength, but you know, in a barrel racing horse, if their core is really strong and you go to a rodeo or a jackpot and the ground isn't great, it's a little shifty, that horse might be able to catch themselves. If they slip a little bit, this horse with the strong core might be able to catch themselves versus the horse that's just made a hundred runs as they're conditioning that horse might hit that shifty ground and actually fall down. So, I mean, preventing injury for your horse, but also preventing, um, injury for you as well. So yeah, we did talk about rest days, not over conditioning. Um, so how many rest days typically do you recommend a week? I would say two. I would be doing interval training. I mean, I say two, but I don't mean every day is just like as hard and as fast as you can either. Right. Some days you may be working some backing up in there, some stretching, um, some things like that. I would say at minimum three days a week to at least maintain the condition you have. Would you say? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, like seven days a week work is, I don't want to exercise seven days a week your horse probably doesn't want to either but yeah you know it's it's hard to create that ongoing stimulus to improve or maintain conditioning if you're having more than three days a week off mm -hmm. i think so yeah for sure um so yeah try to keep it above three i mean six isn't bad as long as some days might be like a leisurely ride especially if they're in smaller pens um not you know moving as much from food to water things like that i think I think, you know, if you can do that, once you commit to it, um, kind of have to stay on it. You can't really condition for three weeks, give them two weeks off. Yeah. Go it back is, to it for three weeks. And then it is pretty amazing how fast, um, your cardiovascular respiratory and actually bone will drop off with, you know, when, when you have rest days. So, um, so yeah, consistency is key for sure. Yeah. Um, this next one is one of my favorite things to talk about because <laughs> I tell everyone to do this. I have no idea how many people actually do, but like get a notebook and a pencil, um, keep it in your trailer or in your tack room and just like literally write down what you did that day. Keep a timer, um, on your wrist, know how long you rode for, know how long you did, you yeah. know, walk, trot, lope, back up, things like that. How many, you know, if your horse is starting at 10 steps backwards, write that down. So next time you can do 12, um, you know, and in two months, if you're at 30 steps backwards, then, you know, you know, you've built on that and you're growing. Um, and I like to see progress I mean, mm -hmm. you're probably the same, but yeah, I think it's really good to see progress at the end of the day. And I think that's the only way you can do it because some days, if you've had a really crappy day and you don't want to go ride, you'll go ride and you might ride for all of 15 minutes, but that's yeah. not, And like you said, with, with your watch or use your phone, like time your workouts, because it's crazy. Once you start using a timer, you think you walked for 20 minutes and it, it's usually not realistically, like it, it'll surprise you. Yeah. Um, so utilize a timer, but yeah, we're always looking at three different variables with conditioning, right? So we're looking at, um, like frequency duration and intensity, right? So considering all those things, so duration is time frequency is like how often, um, or how many times, and then intensity is like amount of exertion. Right. So, um, so yeah, think of all those three things when you're conditioning. Yes. And like I said, consistency is key. I think it's super, um, important, you know, to be dedicated to your horse. Like I said, you usually have to pay to play and these things cost money. It's not, um, it's usually not free. And even if you are just, you know, a, like going trail riding you can't just I wouldn't personally I wouldn't just pull my horse out and go for an eight hour trail ride and not expect my horse to have some repercussions mm -hmm. of that so I mean even if you're planning on going for you know a long trail ride you're still gonna have to plan to condition um before that or else it's gonna cost you because you're gonna have vet bills you're gonna have new horse bills yeah <laughs> um, and if you're like oh gosh I I can't imagine like conditioning my horse for five days a week that's that's cool that's what people are kidding like <laughs> yeah, around for so do. you've got options um if all you want to do is is compete there's lots of high-end yeah. athletes that we see that that's what they do and and that's fine so um but yeah it's it's good to get your horse in somewhere then that they can get 
you know, conditioned where they need to be. So, yeah. or if you're going away on holidays, um, that's important too. Mm-hmm. And then I truly believe that motion is life, even in human medicine. Now, um, if you've broken bones or done anything like that, they very few times they're casting you and telling you to stay still. They are, you know, they might have to do surgery or fix it, but they want to get you moving. I feel like as soon Mm -hmm. as possible, um, you know, gone are the days of, okay, you need to lay on the couch for eight weeks in a full plaster cast and not move at all. Um, so when we say that, what does time off look like? And I think that's, I think this is like maybe the most missed part in a lot of people's programs to success. So a lot of the really successful barrel racers that we work with, um, they don't actually give their horses time off. It's never stand in a small pen for three months eating hay and then try to bring them back. Literally, you know, when we had a Canadian finals, it was (laughs) run at the finals, have, you know, maybe four weeks in their pen off and then back to, you know, maybe just walking a little bit of trotting for a few months until they work back into their program, but it's never been stand there and get completely out of shape and then get completely back into shape. There's never four to five months of those horses having time off. And I do think it really affects their longevity. And I also think it affects their performance, um, year to year, Mm -hmm. which is, which is interesting. There's a little key to people's success. I'm not going to name drop because then I'll get in trouble. But <laughs> um, I do think that that's a really important one too. I mean, if your horse is out moving from feed to water, you can probably do a little bit less, but that's not realistic in a lot of people's situations, you know, limited land, um, yeah. Yeah. stuff like that, or, you know, lots of pens, smaller pens. Um, I think it's really important to keep your horse moving. And this is a really fun fact. If you watch Cooley, um, in the off season, we usually have some sort of a program to keep horses moving, um, at probably like a cheaper cost than what it would be to condition them. So we can use a little bit more Walker, things like that, but we have done programs in the past where, you know, we want them to come for a couple of weeks, um, maybe go home for a couple of weeks, come back for a couple of weeks, things like that. Because I do believe that this is the key to a lot of people's success. Other things to consider. Nutrition is a big one. So, um, it's realistically, you think about the demands we're putting on an athlete and think about like human athletes. I don't think Usain Bolt or any of the Olympians <laughs> are, are eating Doritos and, or inversely, they're not eating salads. Like they're, you know, we have to support the demands of the body and especially a conditioning body. You know, we're putting new muscle fibers down. We're putting a lot of stress on a body. So um, making sure your horse is getting the right nutrition. Um, you know, obviously good quality hay is like the first step, but a lot of those athletes need more, they need more protein, more fat. So, um, if your horse seems like they're lazy, maybe they need more nutrition. Mm-hmm. So, um, so yeah, that's a big one. And, and again, like if that's something you're not really familiar with, or you want some help with, like, we're only a call away and we talk about this stuff all day long, every day. So mm-hmm. we, we are always happy to chat about that. I think too, with nutrition, it used to be with horses, you fed grain and you fed hay. Yeah. Rolled oats and hay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's still, there's nothing wrong with some rolled oats, no. but I do think, you know, there's a lot more you can put into the nutrition. Like Becky said, like looking at your protein and your fats and just giving your horse like all the essential amino acids to make sure they have the building blocks to build stronger muscles and, and repair tissue. Yes. Right. So, yep. Yeah. And that helps a lot with your recovery time mm-hmm. as well. So recovery time in between workouts can be shortened if your horse is, you know, getting the exact nutrition they need and not, not just like a hay diet or, and they'll, you know, especially those muscle fibers, um, and soft tissue fibers, they'll, they'll probably condition a little faster too. If you're giving them Mm -hmm. the building blocks they need to, to build that new strong tissue. And like Becky said, if you have questions about that, you can ask them because they're really (laughs) good at it. You don't have to go spend $800 on 40 different supplements for a month. Yeah. You and, can yeah. simplify it to just a couple. And um, a lot of the really expensive supplements aren't necessarily the best ones. And a lot of horses don't necessarily need supplements. Sometimes they just need the macronutrients. So the protein, the fat and the carbs. And, and lots of times you can do that really inexpensively with simple mm-hmm. stuff. You don't have to get really fancy, um, but there's so much 
stuff out on the market, it's, mm-hmm. it can be overwhelming, like really overwhelming. So no, yeah. it, can be very sim- <laughs> it can be very simple, but it is a really important um, part to your horses. Success. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Farrier. I think we're going to get into that Lucky with guys. Chad and Cody, but, uh, <laughs> but just common sense, right? Like no hoof, no horse. So, um, and just, considering mm-hmm. like what conditions you're working the horse in and making sure they're set up to do that and, and not get sore. Right. So again, if you're riding an endurance horse over all sorts of different grounds, probably they're going to need some shoes or they're going to need foot, you know, like foot maintenance, even if they're barefoot to, to stay in a good spot. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you know, we don't really re- we don't really consider how long it takes to grow that foot out. Yeah. It takes about wrong. a year. So like a year for most horses yeah. from when that little tiny bit of hoof wall starts at the coronary band to get to the tip of the toe, that's a year. So, um, so it can take a while to, to fix something that maybe could have been prevented like a bad hoof wall crack or something. If you know, you just keep up on those feet. So yeah. Find a good farrier, ask questions. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, make sure they're doing a good job. It's, It's like Becky said, it's the most, one of the most important parts, um, to making sure your horse is going to be good. That work, there's nothing wrong with going to your vet and saying, Hey, I don't know if I have a problem, but I would like to get, you know, a checkup done on my horse to make sure that everything is okay. Before I start conditioning, you know, you want to handle all the pain things first and then start working them. And honestly, there's times when they watch a horse trot and you're just like, are you sure? Yeah. Like, that looks sound to me, but it's, Hey, and that's can- great. I love to see those. <laughs> no, but that's when you yeah. usually pick up something else and yeah, you're like, no, actually this, this, and this, and you're like, I don't know. I, and it, you know, it's changed a lot in the last five to 10 years where like, you know, people would bring horses when they were broken where, um, yes. and I don't think it's by accident, but a lot of like very high end successful riders and horses that we're seeing, we yeah. see them before they get broken. So we're seeing those horses every six months or every three months, you know, depending on, on the horse, like we're seeing them before there's a problem because a lot of times we can pick something up so early or or get then preventative, um, versus reactive, you know, now we're dealing with an injury. So, um, so yeah, it's, I think that mentality is changing, um, some disciplines more than others, but yeah, it's, and I think there's a lot more you can do now too, right? Like it's not just, uh, like you said, reactive, it's more preventative noticing that they might be muscle sore somewhere Mm -hmm. or, um, you know, might need strength somewhere. They might just be weaker or lacking yeah. somewhere as opposed. And, you know, it's tough when you see your horse every day. Yeah. Right. When you, when you get like a second set of eyes on it, you're like, Oh, Fresh right. Eyes. I didn't yeah. even see that. You know, I do that with my horse all the time. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, I do that right. with mine. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, like the maintenance, yeah. stuff, you know, and it's, it's a heck of a lot cheaper to come before they're broken. Yeah. Get the maintenance done and then, you know, continue on. It's not saying you're never going to hurt a horse, but you, yeah. if you can reduce. Yeah. That. And, and lots of times we'll see those ones that come in and they just want, yeah, eyes on the horse. And, and a lot of times we don't do anything, but we say like, Hey, maybe, you know, farrier wise, let's try this. Or I think your horse would mm-hmm. like some body work. There's some soreness in the back region today, or, or sometimes Cairo is recommended. It, it just kind of sometimes will then point you in a direction to, that your horse would do well with some maintenance mm-hmm. work from a, even another yeah. professional. So. And you guys offer lots more like shockwave um, yeah. and there's different types of injections. There's yeah. not just steroid injections anymore. So I think that's, that's really important. That's probably like, you know, the best allotment of your funds in the springtime, you know, it might cost you going to one jackpot or something. Um, but that's a heck of a lot better than yeah. cutting your whole season out. So, um, you know, once you know your horse is feeling good, uh, vet wise, getting some body work done. It's nothing wrong with having regular maintenance done. You know, if you're being consistent and you're riding all the time and you're working your horse, um, there's nothing, there's no reason that they wouldn't need some body work somewhere yeah. in there. I mean, I like massage. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, I was a pretty high end elf athlete in a previous life. And like, yeah, it's, you think about an Olympic athlete, like they've got a team with them. They've got a massage therapist and a physiotherapist and yes. a chiropractor. And so it's, it's not really fair to, you know, think your horse doesn't need those things, especially if you want them to perform at a high level, mm-hmm. you know, they're, they're just like us and their bodies are even bigger and go through way more stresses 
per square inch than, than our bodies. Yeah. So and they're also carrying us yeah. <laughs> on top of them <laughs> while they're doing this. Um, and then, like we said, proper fitting to tack, um, is just, it's so important. And I do find English people are a lot better at kind of switching out saddles or, Hey, I'll trade yeah. you this way. Um, Western people kind of get an emotional attachment <laughs> to their saddle. And I'm not, I have that too. I, I'm never, yeah. like, I have all my saddles still. Um, I get emotionally just, attached to bits. I don't know. It's weird. <laughs> uh, but you know, if you have a couple saddles or if you want to have a couple saddles, you know, making sure that they're different trees, don't buy two saddles at the exact same tree, unless your horses are the exact same all the time. Um, you know, both my saddles are different and they fit my horses differently. So I think that's something that's really important. I'm also a huge advocate for like more natural fibers on the horse. So, um, you know, like mohair cinches, um, I love wool pads, things that breathe, things that breathe, (laughs) you know, leather, latigos, um, just things to think about, but I do, I kind of advocate for that because I, I like that. So some other things you can use, we did talk a little bit about a heart rate monitor. Um, Becky can probably talk even more about it, but I do think that if you're very serious about conditioning, I think that that's probably the most serious you can get. Mm -hmm. Um, But it'll also tell you the most about your horse. So a lot of it is, you know, getting their heart rate up. How long does it take to get their heart rate there? What kind of work does it take to get their heart rate to a higher level? And then what is their recovery time? Um, when you start putting them into cool down. Yeah. Yeah. And there's different levels of heart rates, right? Just like with people, I'm sure you've heard of HIIT workouts. That's a high intensity interval training. So that's where your heart rate is in the very, very high level. Um, then there's like medium intensity, low intensity, steady state. So, um, and there's similar things like that with horses. So if you go down that realm or want to go down that road, it can get pretty like, you know, data specific pretty quick. So it might be a little, um, little intense for this conversation, but if you want to get into Mm -hmm. that or or want to get a heart rate monitor, definitely um, let us know because we've got the data there that, you know, this would be good, you know, ranges for your heart rate to be in for certain activities. So, um, and there is a lot of research out there. I think there's even some apps and like Bluetooth stuff that you can get. So yeah, no, there's tons of apps. Polar has a good heart rate monitor Mm -hmm. um, for equine that'll go around their girth. I've used that one before. Um, but I do think that it's just something that if you are really going to dive into the conditioning hole, (laughs) um, I, I think people would be very happy with the results they see. And, you know, like I wear a Fitbit, um, and the things, you know, just the, like, not mindless data, but the data that I use from it just in my everyday life is very interesting. And I think, um, if you're really into conditioning, I think it'd be the same for horses. And like I said, a journal just keeping track, you know, you think you're going to remember, but like, I don't remember what I did two weeks ago, let alone how I worked my horse. Um, so I just think it's really important and you can always flip back. It kind of, it kind of helps you plan your day, plan your ride, um, plan your week, you know, pick out your seven day week and say, okay, this week I'm going to do this on this day. I'm going to do hill work this day. I'm going to go work in this arena this day. And I'm going to go to a jackpot this day and this day they're going to have as a rest day. Um, I'm very much a planner. I like to, yeah. see. I used to do that too. Like I would have, I'd actually make little charts and I'd print them off and I'd put them off my tack room so that I like could look right before I left. And it just, yeah, provides some structure. Sometimes you get on your horse like, Hey, what am I doing today? And then yes. it just, it gets a little unorganized, but basically like in your conditioning programs, you should be allotting days for cardiovascular conditioning, strength training, and suppling exercises. So that's like your stretches, mm-hmm. your flexibility, you know, the ab engagement, stuff like that. So, yeah. um, yeah. Yeah. And then go through. So this is the band system that we use at Cooley. Um, we put it on with a sur single. Uh, they also have a Western pad so you can ride. What's a sur single? A sur people single that don't know. <laughs> is, it's, oh man, it's hard to point. You can, can I move the mouse on the screen? No, you can't. <laughs> okay. Well, a sur single is just, it's basically like a, front cinch or girth that goes all the way around the horse onto the pad. Um, so you don't have to put your saddle on. It's really easy to put on and quick and light. So, I mean, for Western people, it's maybe a little easier to use than lugging your big saddle out there. If you're just going to work your horse in this. Um, and that's the nice thing with the bands is you can ride in them. As you can see, this person has their saddle on, they have a Western system. 
or you can lunge them in it or, you know, work them in a exercise or something like that, because there's no extra things going on in here. There's no like hanging, um, reins or anything like yeah. that. So it's, it's pretty minimal that way. Um, so I really like these, they are not very, um, conforming. So it just is increasing proprioception, making the horses think about working like that, but it's not forcing them into it. So they're better used, um, over time. You're not going to put this on once and see drastic changes in your horse. But, you know, if you, again, add it into your conditioning program that, Hey, twice a week, I'm going to put my horse in this as part of the program or three times a week. Um, and maybe not your whole ride. Um, they're not meant to be used every single time because then your horse becomes dependent on them, but they're just something that's really interesting. Some people have made their own too. Um, yeah, but this is, they're nice. Some- yeah. If you think about it, like, um, especially like glute muscles that it's more of a research thing in humans, but I don't know if you've ever heard of lazy glutes, like neurogenically, they can be hard to turn on glutes and quadriceps. So sometimes these are nice to put on at the beginning and it actually like activates the neuro, like the neural pathways to those muscles. So then you sort of switch them on, you take the bands off and then do your, um, you know, exercising and, and then they're maybe going to utilize those muscles a little more and get more engagement of them. And then again, better building of those muscles. So. Mm-hmm. And then, um, trot poles, trot poles are super easy or walk poles. Um, there's two different methods here. You can also just put them on the ground and lay them out in your arena in a straight line. Um, if you have them raised, it's awesome if they will walk over them, but when you walk over them, you want them, you want the horse like putting their head down and lifting up over them, not diving over them chest first. Um, something that they're really easy to throw on the side of your arena. Um, you can even do them just flat on the ground, just so your horse has to think about picking their feet up. I find horses that are rode more in arena settings, you know, if you take them out to the trees or something, they're like tripping over every yeah. tree that you, every log you try to walk them over. I mean, that's the same concept if you don't have yeah. a bush or something that you can go ride through, but you know, it's just the thought process that they have to think about, oh, I need to pick this foot up and pick this foot up. Um, it's really good for just conditioning their whole body and something different for them. Like I said, super easy to make. You don't have to buy them. There's a couple of different ways to set them up there. Um, and it's funny, like we used to recommend these a lot or you'd see them a lot in the English world, but actually a lot of your Western disciplines, um, I'll recommend these because again, you think about propulsion, those horses have to really activate and propel themselves over those poles. So, um, certain disciplines like barrel racing or roping where you're using those same muscles, like this is a great exercise. So, um, getting a little outside of, you know, the norm for what's been conventional in the past and and looking into other disciplines and and sort of taking what they're using and using it for yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, so Becky, one last question. Mm -hmm. What does a conditioning program in your mind look like starting out, starting just walking, Yeah, I guess it depends like where your horse is left off. If we're starting with a super blank slate, like I would say walking and, and I guess like more of what we do is more rehab stuff like versus conditioning. But yeah, we're usually starting with walking. Um, and, and I like, you know, it's low intensity aerobic exercises. Um, and basically you want to get to the point where your horse can do low intensity walking without, you know, extra exertion, I guess, or easy recovery for 50 to 60 minutes is, is the goal. So, um, which really most horses, that's pretty doable. Like, you know, I can pull a lot of them are doing that in their pen. If exactly. Their pen, so, yes. but if you get on your horse and, and you can't walk them for 50 minutes without them being like sweated up and they're like, you know, they're tired, then mm-hmm. certainly you don't want to go to the next step until you've got to that point. So, yeah. um, so yeah, that's basically, uh, and that I think usually works out to if it's 50 or 60 minutes at six to eight kilometers for the average horse. So, um, start with that, um, see how they go for an hour. If you know, that's a big job for them, then keep yeah working at that until that stimulus, basically what we call goes away. So once yeah. that, once that's easy that's, for them, we, yeah. Then recovery it's, time is short. Yeah. It seemed like they didn't even do any work Yeah, then you can start increasing. And I think that's kind of how you progress through your program. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you can start then adding some trotting and if they're recovering from it, quite well. Um, you know, it's progress over time. So if they're recovering and stuff like that, 
then you can start adding in some more, you know, loping or cantering, um, going a little faster in recovery time after that. And then, you know, you can start incorporating some of the interval or cross training methods that we mentioned as well. Um, start going through those and just working them up as you go. Um, but yeah, just always thinking like ticking the boxes. So we want that horse cardiovascularly fit. So heart and lungs strength training. Um, and then yeah, suppling exercises. So just like thinking of human athletes, we want them fit as far as muscles fit as far as heart and lungs and flexible. So those are like three main components and working that into your program. However, that works for you. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Questions. I don't know how we see those. <laughs> Popping in. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah, Louisa. Uh, yeah, I'm just in the, they're literally in the next room. It's really weird. Uh, we did actually a couple of people mentioned that they, they use the Equilab app, which tracks riding, um, length walked, et cetera. It's GPS. So that's really cool. I actually looked into it. It seems really awesome. It has a safety feature, so it can alert, um, friends and family that you list if you, you know, are out trail riding or whatever, and you get hurt. So it's kind of neat. Um, so a couple people mentioned they use that when you guys were talking about tracking. And then we did have a question around the nutrition. Uh, what source of protein do you recommend? Ooh. Actually, you've got a good source at Cooley. <laughs> I personally, I love um, spirulina. So we feed the G's spirulina. And the reason um, chosen that one is it's certified to not have any harmful metals or anything like any chemicals, things like that, which is really important with spirulina because it's grown, can literally be grown anywhere in the ocean. And so if it's grown in contaminated waters, um, then you're feeding mm -hmm. your horse kind of junk. Whereas uh, the G's is certified to not have any of that in it. So that's why we love that one. But, um, yeah. spirulina is a complete protein. So it has all of the essential amino acids that are the building blocks, um, for building muscles. So yeah. it's all natural. The horses eat it really easily. Um, and it's really, it's fairly cost effective, um, to feed as well. And you just add a little bit in, it's not like you need to be lugging big feed bags with you. So that's, that's the protein source that, that we love. And yeah. we feed a lot of spirulina is good. Even like, um, looking at your hay source. So like, um, you know, if you can find a hay that's 14% protein, that's awesome. Um, that's might be a little tricky to find depending <laughs> where you're getting your hay from even, um, pelleted feeds. So things like step eight by Hoffman's, um, actually I love Purina or Trutina products and they've got some performance or specific feeds, but look at that label. Yeah. Like 15% protein is, is really, really good for, for a horse. So, um, aiming sort of for that in your diet is, is good, but yeah, spirulina is a great one or like any blue green algae sort of thing. Again, mm -hmm. like spirulina is nice. Cause it, you know, that it's sourced from a good place. Um, some of those blue green algae supplements on the market, I'm not really sure where they're getting that from. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure what little particles may be in there as well. But yeah, I usually say like as a first line, spirulina is a great option for getting protein or a pelleted complete feed. So yeah. And we do have, um, your horse will eat tabs. Spirulina is great to yeah. eat in the tab version. So we have the tab version or the powder. Yeah. Horses. Traditionally, like before, you know, it was more of a commercial product for horses. You used to get able to get it at bulk barn just as a powder. I guess some people have been having a little trouble finding it, but that is another place you can sort of source it out if you're not in our area. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah. Or on connected by <laughs> <laughs> Um, this one's more of a testimonial to what you guys are talking about working with, uh, your, the team approach with a veterinarian. Nicolay said, I found having Chad as her veterinarian, uh, doing regular exams and then regular body work has really hel helped me catch issues before they get bad. So kind of what you guys were touching on working together so that it's more preventative than reactive. And then uh, Lois Garrett says, we drive all of our horses. So they drive them uh, and really notice the development of the top line. Would the conditioning steps be the same for a driven horse versus an under saddle horse? Yeah. I mean, essentially, pretty yeah, pretty similar. Like, you know, you're, you're going to have a little more of an eccentric demand on those horses as far as you're going to need more muscle strength than maybe 
horses in other disciplines that may be more of an aerobic based discipline, um, say like a, a race horse, but, um, but absolutely those horses that drive really have to use collection. Um, and so it's not surprising that they have great top lines. Um, I guess the one thing I was going to point out to top line wise, protein wise, if you're feeding your horse a lot of protein and you're lacking top lines still, and, and you're confident there's no back pain present, um, vitamin E, a lot of horses in our area are vitamin E deficient, vitamin E selenium. Um, and that can really affect your, your muscling too. So if you're doing all those things, you're not getting great results, consider adding that on too. There's some really good supplements out there. Vitamin E selenium wise, um, vitamin E and selenium doesn't stay in our hay very long. So, um, once you swath and cut hay, um, there's vitamin E in it, but it actually goes away quite quickly. So if you're feeding hay, that's, um, been stored for several months, there's probably not much in it. So we do find in Alberta, um, they get quite deficient and that affects our muscling and the horses in their top lines. So. Perfect. Well, I think that is everything. I don't think there's any other questions. So just want to say a huge thank you to Dr. Becky Tees for coming up to the boardroom today and to Katie Imler of Cooley Equine. If you guys want to find more information out by Cooley, you can go on their website, Facebook and Instagram. They're all over the place, CooleyEquine.com. Uh, and like, like we had said at the very beginning, uh, Dr. Becky Tees and often Dr. Andrea Smith are at Cooley once a week on Wednesdays, uh, working on catching up with rehabilitation cases, conditioning cases, and haul-in appointments just for general soundness and everything else that we do in a day. So if you do want to visit the team at Cooley and see us at the same time, we are up there as well. So big thanks to Katie and to Becky for the first half of this chat. I uh, really appreciate you guys. We are going to, I'm going to have them turn off their camera and their mic. We're going to find Chad. I don't know where he is. And we're going to drag him upstairs with Cody and uh, probably take about a 10 minute uh, bathroom break and then go from there. Thanks so much, guys. Got it. Thank you.